Hi everybody, my name is Dev Bannett and what I want to do in this video is sort of um, a little bit illustrate and sort of unpack uh, how our perceptions really define the way that we experience everything in our, in our lives, in our individual lives. And um, I want to sort of do it in, in, a, in a more specific kind of way, but just to sort of you know, generally approach that, that statement, which is you know, your perceptions pretty much define how you experience life. Um, so it's really, um, it's, a, it's a kind of almost like this background problem, is, it's, it's very underrated, at least in my life and my experience, is that how, how the way that you fundamentally see someone or something um, essentially defines and captures how you relate to that someone or that something. And just as a basic example, if you uh, perceive another person for whatever reason, let's say someone tells you about somebody else that they're, uh, they're threatening or that they're unpleasant, or that they're a bully, um, so then the way that you'll perceive them from a distance is in that way and that will kind of determine your emotional response First of all, it'll determine the types of thoughts that you have about that person It'll determine your emotional response You might feel uh, a little bit protective or standoffish towards that person and you'll definitely also on the external level practically You will probably try to create some distance and avoid them to whatever degree you feel is necessary to protect yourself from that perception of threat that they have um, and that's really just a kind of a very uh, obvious example of how the way that you perceive another person um, could be very, very um, impacting of the way that you relate to them. But then the, the corollary to that is that if your perception is inaccurate and the way that you see them is actually not the way that they are, so then that's kind of a funny thing because now suddenly you have this deviation between your perception and the actual truth of what's going on in the situation, that the person is actually maybe not threatening, maybe the person who told you that that's their situation, that's their, that's their deal, was actually um, inaccurate in their description and was maybe saying it for some kind of an ulterior motive and was not really telling you the truth. And now you have a situation where your perception of somebody can really diverge and deviate from the actual truth on the ground in the situation. And we have this fascinating capacity to do that. In other words, human beings have the ability to actually overlay their perceptions on top of the actual world that they live in and then instead of relating to the world as it is they relate to the world as they perceive it and that might seem in some to some of you might sound obvious to others it might sound very profound or clear um, but the point is that it happens and we do this constantly in other words we're always looking inside of our own heads to try to understand what's going on around us and that very often can interfere act as a buffer or even a barrier uh, between us and the actual world around us that we that we live in and that we experience and so when you think about that a little carefully i mean it, it bleeds into literally every aspect of, of human of human existence and so many discussions that are going on in the world today and different issues in in, in western culture and eastern culture and philosophy and, and every area of experiential life um, relationships is a huge one just the way that we relate to each other in terms of perceptions and seeing we see each other the way that we're used to seeing each other as opposed to learning genuinely who the other person is and constantly updating our understanding of them as they grow and evolve but instead we tend to have fixed perceptions of others and and we sort of just relate to them as we remember them it's also true that we relate to ourselves in that exact same way we tend to perceive ourselves in a certain way and different, different aspects of ourselves and then relate to ourselves also in a relatively fixed way which has all kinds of um, re, you know uh, results and implications as well for how we deal with our own lives and the kinds of decisions that we make but what I want to do with that just for right now is I want to take one concept one idea um, this is a Torah concept and the issue with Torah concepts is the same as the issue with everything which is that you have the ability to actually create a perception of a concept that is also divergent from the actual truth of the concept, which is a fascinating phenomenon because it's, you know, just to describe how you can look at the physical world and misunderstand it conceptually because of your perceptions. You can also look at the intangible conceptual world and misunderstand it conceptually because of your perceptions. So I want to just sort of pick one concept just to use for today for this just very brief kind of like almost like an introductory video to all of these ideas. Um, and that concept is the, the word for it in Hebrew and in the Torah is the word neshama. Now, the word neshama is a funny word. It means, you usually translate in English into the word soul. Uh, and here's where you start getting perceptual uh, um, interference. Because as soon as you bring in a translation, so if you have some kind of an associated perception of the meaning of that translation, so then that will start to interfere with your actual understanding of the, of the concept that is embedded objectively inside of the word. In other words, it, the, the, the word neshama has an actual meaning. And that is a meaning that is text-based. It is a meaning that is that is intrinsic as you just analyze the word. I mean, the fact that the word itself uh, seems to be from the word nasham, which basically means like to breathe, which is a very strange thing. I'm not going to analyze the linguistics too much right now, but the point right now that I'm trying to make is that 
you have an ability to actually perceive um, the word in a way that you associate with it as opposed to what the word itself is trying to convey according to itself. And this is all predicated on the assumption that whoever wrote the Torah uh, was actually trying to express some set of ideas and then those ideas, the words themselves, are actually internally consistent. The person did not just have like these random words that are just open to a million interpretations that you can just twist into whatever perception you want. There was an actual underlying intent. And that's really a separate topic, and you know we can make a whole long video about that, just sort of illustrating how that's true. Um, but before we even get into that, just to sort of make the point in terms of this one concept, that when you think about the word neshama, and so if you tend to think about it as a soul, well, there's a lot of discussions about souls. There's some people that believe in souls, some people that don't believe in souls, and say, well, well, the soul lives on even when you die. And these are all kinds of like the types of language that float around. And, you know, definitely in today's, in today's world, there's a lot of skepticism in the more liberal communities about, well, maybe there's no such thing as, as the soul and the afterlife and, you know, God and all these ideas. And, and so I want to sort of um, kind of cut through all of that and get a little more real and a little more specific and authentic with what the word actually is referring to. And I think that once we do that, what's cool about that is that, you know, suddenly if, if, if you understand what the word means and you then update your perceptions a little bit to sort of include that, you'll find that it's, a, it's something which is pretty much inarguable. In other words, you can't really argue against the existence or manifestation of this thing that we call the neshama that the Torah is describing. You can say that it might not mean anything to you, but you can't really deny that it is operating. So I just want to describe what that is. And then, uh, you know, then, you know, you can think about exactly what that implies for you. Um, so, but the actual word neshama is supposed to represent the experience that we have of ourselves as consciousness. In other words, you constantly are operating as if you are someone. You look out through your eyes, and when you look into the eyes of another person, so the you that's looking out through the eyes, it's not that you are your eyes or that you're just this thing. There's almost like a, a, you have this experience of there's me and I'm just looking out from inside of this and the me that's inside is like kind of just here looking out and then there's all these other people that I'm talking to and then so when I look into somebody else's eyes, I'm not looking at their eyeballs because I want to sort of appreciate the machinery of the biological construct that they are. I'm looking for them, just like I know that I'm me inside of myself, I'm experiencing that. I'm looking for that other self who is coming out through those eyes and who is operating, you know, using this set of tools and sort of manifesting their self into the actual outside world that, it, that we live in, that these bodies live in, that we are constantly trying to use. So that's what you're looking for whenever you interact with another human biological organism like this. You're not actually trying to just interface with another body to just have like a, a machine based body experience or maybe even if you want to describe it that way you experience it minimally as if there is you doing that and so and just to sort of to, to say that more clearly it's like you're looking to see the other self that is literally shining through this thing i'm shining through this thing right now and you're again shining is an analogy there's no actual shine but it's just like the sense of like well there's just someone coming through this and so human beings operate with that basic awareness. We are always looking for that self when we interact with other cells. Whenever you see somebody waving at you, you don't say to yourself, oh, look, there's a complex um, you know, biochemical organism that is now moving all these trillions of building blocks in unison. Like, look at this, like all these, these cells are like all moving in unison like that. No one says that. You don't, you just, you, you know that whenever you make your body do this, there's you doing it. And then this thing is like just an expression of you and you're trying to make a greeting to bridge the gap between here and the other self that you're trying to get to by making these little bo body movements. And that's, since you know that's what you're doing when you're doing that, so when you see somebody else doing that, you also interpret it in that exact same way. So it's this built-in perspective of like you just are looking to see that there's someone else literally shining through this thing. Now, that, that phenomenon, first of all, is what we mean when we describe neshama. It's called consciousness in science today, and there's a whole discussion about what is consciousness, and that's really the greatest mystery of our time, but it's very hard to deny that you're experiencing that. In other words, when someone says to me, oh, well, I don't believe in that, so I always say back, well, who is the one who is saying they don't believe in it? In other words, you're, taking, you're, you're using the very experiential um, you know, side of yourself that says that you are someone to deny that you are someone. So you're the one who is now saying that you don't exist, which is a funny thing to say because you're the one who's saying it. So, and you're experiencing yourself as if, well, I have an opinion, I believe this, this is how I think about myself. And the whole, the whole um, you know, backdrop of that set of ideas is embedded on top of 
the assumption that you're someone and that you have your own self that can now make these comments and think these ideas and you're the one who's experiencing all of that. So it's it's a given at this point in terms of our experiential knowledge that this is what this is what we're experiencing. Now we can have a discussion about what exactly that means and there's really, you know, two main approaches to like what exactly consciousness is. And one approach is that it's something which is somehow intangible and beyond beyond the measurable world and is somehow linked to a body and is coming through. And it's pretty much the way the Torah describes it. Um, and then the other option is that it's some kind of an illusion of the brain, which um, we can have a much longer discussion about both of those ideas. Um, but the point is that any way you slice it, even if you believe that consciousness is something which is just an, an illusion of the brain, you experience that all the time. Like you literally con constantly experience that, that, that phenomenon. So, and this is not a new problem. This is a very old issue. It's been known for, you know, philosophers, psychologists, doctors, you know, everybody has been struggling with this, with this idea for literally centuries and millennia. Like, what is the nature of the I am, of the, that I'm someone, that I'm a self? But the point I'm just trying to make right now is that whenever the Torah talks about neshama, so the Torah is not talking about some kind of invisible thing that you have to just believe in that we call a soul, and it's kind of like over there somewhere, and maybe you believe in it, maybe you don't believe in it. The Torah has, for literally, I mean, 3,000 years and more, has been doing two basic things in terms of this issue. It has been describing the basic phenomenon of your sense of self, your experience, which is what the neshama is, and then the second part of what it's been doing is describing the dynamics of how that self interacts with this thing what we call the body like all the parts in very very specific pieces here's all the different layers and nuances of how it breaks down and then how that kind of operates inside of the physical space the measurable spatial and time-based um, universe that we kind of live in that this thing lives in that we kind of come in through that and it describes it in its totality in terms of like both how it starts off in terms of its total timelessness and it's beyond space and time in a very uh, profound way which again you can actually experience that and then how it slowly translates itself into a time and space based phenomenon, which is what this thing is. And then we use this thing to basically bridge the gap between different um, selves that are essentially almost like segregated into different bodies. And you can kind of bridge the gap by, uh, by using this set of tools to reach out to other selves that are around you. So the Torah has been describing that for thousands of years. Now, that's a really just an important clarification, because if you perceive the word soul as some kind of random maybe I don't believe in it because it's just invisible kind of thing, that is very different and will really diverge sharply from your experience of your own life that you're actually ha having at exactly the same moment that you are saying you don't believe in the soul. Like when you say, I don't believe in some kind of invisible soul that is you know, immortal or something, you could say that, but like it, what we mean when we say the word neshama, which is the original, you know, the original word for soul, or for whatever word you want to use in English, but the original word that Christianity is built upon and Islam, all the different approaches that say that you still live after your body dies, they're all built on the assumption that you are the self. That's what the word actually means. That's a pretty big difference of perception of what the word is talking about because, again, like, everybody believes in that idea. In other words, you can say that you don't, you don't empirically think that it's true. That's the worst you can, you can say. So it's, a, it's the hardest you can go against it. You can say... There's no way to measure this, so empirically it's not true. You could say that. Uh, we, can, we have no way of seeing consciousness. But the thing is, is that even if you say that, you still believe that you are conscious, and you still live as if you are conscious. And it is, again, the most central, is comprises 95% of your life. It's like this is the experience of life that you're having. So the point is that as a beginning to illustrate this perception and reality um, divergence that takes place, so I really am just trying to sort of show how when we talk about Torah concepts, you have the ability to actually take your perceptions and shove them in. And instead of reading what's actually going on and learning what's actually going on in the description the Torah presents, you're only learning your own ideas and you're sort of shoving them into the text. So the soul, well, the soul means this, and I don't believe in that, so therefore it's something which doesn't matter, which is a funny thing to do because you're, you're, it's like a straw man argument. You're basically creating your own problem and saying this can't be true, and then you're rejecting it. But what the Torah is speaking about has nothing to do with your ideas about you know, um, just that there's an invisible soul or something that, that you have. What the Torah has been saying for thousands of years is that you are not, you don't have a soul. You are a neshama. That's what you are. You are a self that is using this thing. And then there's a whole set of mechanics that describes how that works. And again, you can decide to deny that or whatever you want to do, but you're constantly going to be experiencing that. And so that's a very important um, distinction that I think sort of begins to illustrate a potential pathway to really encountering what the Torah is trying to say in a way that is much more true, real, authentic, 
um, holistic, inclusive, instead of there being kind of like these random ideas that are sort of floating around and people have all kinds of different perceptions and, and preconceived and postconceived ideas of what they mean. Instead, it's like, here is a very clear, concrete fact about your experience of life. The word Neshama describes that, and then we can lay out a series of follow-up facts that are also described by the Torah that really build on and expand that perspective uh, and that really that phenomenon that you're constantly experiencing. So that's some food for thought. I hope that was relatively interesting and um, looking forward to seeing you in the next video.